All right, so we are live now. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. I'm really Hello. delighted to have Professor Barbara Fredrickson of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, with us. I'm going to close my uh, email. That might once in a while ping me otherwise. Um, and um, uh, most of you guys are familiar with Professor uh, Fredrickson, of course. Uh, many of you have taken my course, and uh, we have a small segment with uh, Professor Fredrickson there. I interviewed her about five years back, just before that course launched. And I'm also sure that many of you have taken uh, Professor uh, Fredrickson's course yourself. Uh, it's called Positive Psychology. It's on Coursera. Uh, it's got a really fabulous rating. And if you haven't taken it, uh, you know that's a treat for you. All right, you can go take it. You're all interested in happiness, and you'll learn a lot from that course. Okay, so Professor Fredrickson, um, and if you don't mind, um, may I call you Barb? Yes, please do. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm going to call you Barb. Um, and uh, those of you who are here, please tell us a little bit about uh, your background, where you're from. So we already have Paola saying she's from Mexico. Um, and uh, also tell us a little bit about your your profession. Okay. So every time I ask you for a different question, and this time I want to I want I want to know what your profession is, and in particular, if you happen to be in the happiness space in some way or the other. Let's say you're a consultant, um, or maybe you're a chief happiness officer somewhere or you're really um, interested in becoming a life coach, okay? Just type it out in capital, saying that I'm in the happiness business, whatever your profession is, okay? So that way when Elena comes in the second half and asks questions, we'll be able to um, kind of pick that information out, okay? So thank you very much. All right, so, but my first question to you is this, okay? So I got my PhD in um, 2000 from NYU, and um, one of my first articles to come out in JPSP was on this idea that, um, People who feel good, people who feel positive, are more capable of paying attention to things that are um, uh, useful to them, even if it's somewhat negative, right? If you're in a positive mood, you're more likely to go for that medical checkup, okay? Mm -hmm. You're more likely to open, you know, back in the day uh, when you sent out manuscripts, it, it was through snail mail, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that you remember this, and yeah. you'd get those reviews back, and, you know, they'd be, you know, it'd be stressful when you opened it because, you know, you didn't know what the outcome was. Um, and you're, you're, what we found is that you're more capable of processing that information, more capable of seeking out constructive feedback if you're feeling positive than negative. Mm -hmm. uh, and we call it mood as a resource. This was with uh, Yaakov Trope. Um, and you know, the background to all this, you know this really well, um, is that lots of papers that said that negative moods rather than positive moods promote more elaborate processing, more deliberation, and it's better if you want to get a stop, something done to be in a negative rather than a positive mood. And it's against the backdrop that that paper came out. And yeah. um, your paper on Broaden and Bill theory, by the way, I just checked on Google Scholar. It's got like close to 20,000 sites, <laughs> 20, sites, OK? Yeah. This is mind blowing, OK? This is mind blowing, guys. Those of you who are watching it, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, I'll, I'll just let you know that as a researcher, even to get, I don't know, you know, 100 citations for a paper on Google Scholar is a big deal. Okay, So 20,000 is just out of this world. So it's clearly made a big impact. I want you to start by telling us a little bit about the background, how you got to researching positivity. And did you feel the positive emotions just from personal experience? I felt it myself, that I was more productive when I was positive. Did you feel that? How did you kind of relate to the articles that said that it's better to be in a negative mood was it an inspiration of some sort to get you started on this? And finally, end a little bit with this broaden and build theory. Just give us a little bit of a synopsis of it. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to uh, say from the start, I really like this mood as a resource work. I loved, liked it right from the start because it mapped really well onto this idea that um, positive uh, affect creates an openness. Um, and that openness can be what you need to be less defensive about um, uh, or less fearful about um, not being able to handle what the world gives to you. Um, from the work that I've done on resilience, it, it's, uh, you know, the people who are more resilient to adversity are ones who tend to have more positive emotions and tend to feel positive emotions alongside their negative emotions. So mm -hmm. it's not like you either feel good or you feel bad. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, um, the most adaptable ones among us can, you know, kind of say, well, here's the good and here's the bad and, and kind of um, toggle back and forth between them. Um, I got interested in this area really just totally in a geeky intellectual puzzle way. 
I had been um, part of this very first NIH funded postdoc program on emotion research. Um, started by Paul Ekman, Dick Lazarus, Bob Levinson, uh, Jak Panksepp, Richie Davidson. And they were trying to kind of remedy the fact in our the science of psychology that for decades there hadn't been any research on emotions. Um, we were still like 50 years later feeling the aftershocks of behaviorism. Um, if you follow the history of psychology, there was this uh, uh, era in the early 20th century that said internal things like thoughts, emotions, they're all irrelevant. It's all behavior reinforcement. Now, reinforcement is a big thing. It's important, but it doesn't mean that people don't have thoughts and they don't have feelings and that those also don't matter but it had a, a big chilling effect on um, what's now called affective science, which just didn't exist um, back then. So I was part of this first cohort of research on emotions. All, most of that work, almost all of it was on negative emotions. Nobody, right when, the, right when affective science was getting rekindled, I mean, there were, there'd been a little bit of affective science um, uh, before behaviorism, but it really got squelched. Um, in that, those initial trying to get it back on the scientific agenda, there was just no research on positive emotions. And that just struck me as, as, um, odd, you know, mm -hmm. not, not that I had like grown up as like this really positive person and I needed to get my feelings on the scientific agenda. Um, probably the, the opposite of that. Um, I had grown up in a very emotionally stoic family that never discussed emotions. I mean, I didn't, I showed up in this postdoc program saying, what, what is this thing called emotion? Why do you studied? You know, what, why do people talk about it? And so um, I was just kind of getting the lay of the land with the negative emotions. And it's um, the, the really prominent theory of the time was that emotions evolved to, um, deal with uh, threats to life and limb, you know, that um, emotions come with specific action tendencies that um, nudge us in the direction of doing things that were useful for our ancestors to get out of um, threats to life and limb. Like um, run away when you're afraid or attack when you're angry and spit something out of your mouth when you're disgusted. And that was the prominent theory of the time but there was no room for positive emotions in that theory. Mm -hmm. they, they, just, oh, they just acted as if positive emotions didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask you a very quick kind of um, uh, clarification question. Um, do you think that you're more embracing of emotions now? You said that you came from a stoic family. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I, um, I was a great beneficiary of having studied in this area. Um, I would say that... Um, uh, yeah, it probably saved my life in terms of uh, my health and my relationships to like realize that, oh, you know, all this stuff piling up on my desk is really uh, provides information about life and how to live it, mm -hmm. <laughs> not just uh, kind of geeky science stuff. But um, it was more geeky science hypothesis testing and theory building that got me into it. And then before I wrote my first book is when I started to realize that, wait a minute, people need to know this stuff because it's relevant to mm. how you organize your day, how do you approach problems, how do you, um, how do you raise your kids, how do you supervise um, graduate students or, or supervisees in your organization. It's relevant to every corner. And yeah. um, that was something that when I started down this path, I certainly didn't anticipate that uh, I was just kind of doing my work <laughs> then, Great. And, uh, by the way you just heard Bob say that you know it's relevant for all these things so if you have questions on any of those particular kind of you know um contexts or domains let's say that you're a doctor right and I do see that somebody's a doctor here just ask us questions okay how can I use some of the things that you're going to hear about talk about how can I use it in my context all right sorry for that interruption please go oh on. no hey um better to have a dialogue yeah <laughs> Good.
professional ha uh, hazard of uh, professors is that you can just go on a little too long. So you should interrupt me at any time. Uh -huh. By the way, I'm a professor too, so I totally understand that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So you, you were kind of building up to the Gordon and Bill theory, I think, you know, just kind of giving us a little bit of an idea of your trajectory and your past experiences. Right, right. So it's, I, um, uh, I had done some work in positive emotions before I um, developed the theory. And, um, you know, th those were giving some clues as to what, what might be. Um, I was interested in why did humans have positive emotions in the first place in terms of what, how did they contribute to survival? Mm -hmm. And so that's the the framework through which I come to the broaden and build theory that it's adaptive to have ways that um, uh, your mind becomes more open and receptive, just automatically, not by trying, not by becoming a meditator or mm -hmm. uh, going to school. <laughs> that um, by nature's design, we have moments that lead to that openness and make us more receptive for learning and growth and uh, developing our, our capabilities. Um, and the insight that I had that um, separates a, a way that we understand the evolved value of negative emotions versus positive emotions is that negative emotions tend to have their adaptive value right in the moment that you experience them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of the kind of ancestral wisdom that it's bringing to mind, it's useful right then and there. For positive emotions, that's not the case. Positive emotions are more like um, eating your fruits and vegetables. They're like nutrients that you need to have in, in, as part of your regular diet so that you're on a trajectory of growth um, in your life, as opposed to a positive emotion isn't gonna save your skin right when you're feeling it. So, mm -hmm. so that was a, uh, an important sort of theoretical shift to be able to separate out, you know, maybe we have one way of understanding the adaptive value of positive valence states, uh, things that feel good versus feel bad. That's awesome. So what would you say about pleasure though? You know, would you say that, um, so just to back up a little bit, I think your theory is that when you're feeling positive, you're more open, you're more willing to, you know, be stimulation seeking, venture down this alley in Paris, let's say you're in a great mood, uh, you're more likely to venture down an unfamiliar alley and then check out a new macaroon store, perhaps, or whatever. Um, whereas if you're feeling negative, you're likely to be more close. You use this analogy of the flower, which I really like, right? Mm -hmm. You're more like an open sunflower when you're happy, taking in the sunshine and everything. But when you're feeling negative, you're like a closed tulip or something. Right. Yeah. Well, and also I, I think of, you know, if you were that flower and your face were like inside those you know, when the petals come in, they're blinders, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. they, it's like, you know, it's like being a horse with blinders on. You really only see what's in front of you. And that is um, been uh, well demonstrated by neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists that, you know, our peripheral vision expands. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we see more of our surroundings, not only because it shifts uh, our, our brain intake is more, but also very simply was because we're looking up more yeah <laughs> and when you when you have your head up you can see more than if you have your head down that is um, so okay uh, so so my, my i have two questions here and the, uh, let me start with the first one on 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 so the broaden and build theory is for positive emotions um and would you say that it matters that you know uh, what kind of positive emotion you're experiencing let's say that it's it's love is more likely to open you up than let's say serenity or joy or would you say that all positive emotions have this effect? Well, I think um, there are likely to be some differences. Um, more recently, I've been writing about how uh, love uh, may have uh, greater benefits because it's um, kind of socially sustained more. I can talk more about that in a minute. But um, I do think that there's uh, a wide range of positive emotions that lead to a broadened awareness. I don't believe that physical pleasure or just pleasure alone mm -hmm. carries that. I think that um, emotions that are more about um, uh, the ways you interpret the world um, as opposed to just a, um, 
uh, physiological response to um, one way pleasures are understood is it's like you know something that in the moment the body needs mm -hmm. now obviously we have all kinds of addictions that are about overdoing pleasure so mm -hmm. I don't want to be misunderstood that pleasure is always good but um, for example we know that if you're um, if you just come out from a really cold temperature you know a warm bath feels yep. good but if you come in from a really hot day that same temperature bath feels awful mm -hmm. Um, so what feels good often depends on what we what we need. You know, if you're really parched, then a glass of water tastes good. But if you've just had like you know half gallon of water, it's you know it's uh, pleasure really has to do with you know um, balancing out internal physiological needs a lot of times, um, not exclusively, but um, and so they're less cognitive. You know, it's more of a um, um, you know, things taste good because you need to ingest those nutrients. Um, so uh, I think that pleasure alone is just one strand, mm -hmm. one kind of facet of positive emotions, and that the broadening comes when that facet is joined together with interpretations of the world that allow you to feel like, oh, I'm safe, I can take things in. Great. Yeah. So that's wonderful. So that's the broadening aspect. And when you broaden, you're taking in more information, you're exposing yourself to new environments, new stimuli, and that in, in turn, in the long run, especially helps you build new skills. And that's the mm -hmm. idea of broadening and build theory, right? Um, uh, that's great. And uh, those who are tuning, tuned in, I'd love it if you could just type in very quickly, uh, whether you yourself agree that positive emotions make you more productive in the long run. Okay. I just want to get a little bit of an assessment, kind of like a poll but not really a poll, just type in, yeah, you know, I've discovered it for myself and positivity works, or you think that the opposite is true, okay? And if you think the opposite is true, tell us a little bit about what what led you to that, that negative emotions are more productive for you, and then maybe we'll circle back to you in the Q&A session. Okay, so in the meanwhile, I want to go back to this idea of um, broadening and build theory. Um, what do you think about, and this is going to be a slightly maybe controversial question, okay, what do you think about um, recreational drugs like um, ecstasy or uh, you know things that elevate your mood okay and don't just feel they don't just feel pleasurable I think I think that they do have this maybe kind of like you know they, they artificially get you to feel experience a state of joy right um, so would you recommend that then uh, you know just from the narrow perspective of making you more broad right um, or do you think on balance it's a bad thing well, I think that um, there are kind of reasons why certain drugs become recreational drugs because they're um, kind of capitalizing on human tendencies to want to be drawn towards uh, more positivity, more openness. Um, I guess I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of actually that tells you something about human nature. Maybe we should find the... Uh, the um, more uh, original to our ancestors way of getting to those same states, mm. you know? So um, I think that uh, those, the popularity of certain drugs tells us something about what people value and seek, but also there are almost always, you know, non-drug, non-pharmaceutical ways to get to those similar states. Um, like a lot of times, the problem is they take time, though, right? I mean, they they, they, more, they they take more time. Yeah. So they if you're about mindfulness, for example, I mean, it's like yoga. Um, if you have body aches or you're not flexible, just doing one session is not going to do it. You know, <laughs> you got to like maybe do it for a month. So that's the downside to it, I suppose. That's true. Um, I think we need to just, as a culture, learn to have a little more patience. <laughs> Are you talking to millennials? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, that's fair. So um, I let me ask you a personal question. Uh, what kind of practices do you have in your life and place that you do almost on an everyday basis in mm -hmm. order to promote your positivity? And, and can, you, can you share some of them, especially low-hanging fruit? That's relatively easy to implement, right? Mm -hmm. But have big... Um, consequences, positive effects? Um, a huge one for me is get outside. I mean, I spend time outside um, uh, every morning if I can, before I start my day, either go for a walk or go for uh, what 
what might be called a run, but it's pretty slow. <laughs> I can almost walk faster than I run. Um, so, but uh, just getting outside, being active, being in nature. Um, and is that a solitary activity or did you do you do it with your partner or it depends yeah. you know um, often by myself but not always um and when i want to get together with uh, my sister or a friend or somebody who lives remotely and especially right now i usually do it while i'm walking um mm -hmm. so instead of like being tied to a zoom call <laughs> i feel like i'm a prisoner of this uh camera and this um uh format in the last couple months. So especially when I'm gonna connect with someone socially, I try to get out, get outside. I really think that um, humans need much more time outside than we give ourselves. One of my former uh, doctoral students, actually he um, moved from Texas to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan when I was there. Mm -hmm. And Ann Arbor is really cloudy and gray. And so that got him really interested in seasonal affective disorder. And we published a paper together to show that the more um, people had argued that the, the, there's no connection between weather and mood. Mm -hmm. And he felt personally that that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. And he was able to solve the puzzle that there is no connection between weather and mood unless you spend time outside. Oh. So it's moderated by you need to spend at least 20 minutes or more outside. Mm -hmm. And then there's an, there's an effect between weather and mood. Yeah. But if you spend your entire time inside, then you don't benefit from a nice clear day. So, um, uh, and that there's broadened awareness that can come just from being outside um, in, in um, better weather, better weather meaning high pressure. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, but anyway, so that's one big thing for me. I also, uh, meditate, but you know, kind of, I'm not religious about it. I, um, kind of realized that my time outside is my, uh, meditation practice. Uh, and if I can't get outside, I spend more time, you know, inside meditating. So, mm -hmm. so you're not religious about it, but you're spiritual about it. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's definitely a part of um, my life. I do a lot of informal uh, meditation, which uh, we just recently published a paper on informal meditation, meaning you're not stopping what you're doing by sitting on a cushion, but you um, take a few moments to feel your breath in the middle of the day while you're cooking or washing vegetables or, um, or wishing somebody well just silently to yourself as a way to remember kindness. So, um, you know, after you have a, a formal meditation practice, those informal ways of bringing it into your life just kind of become second nature. Um, so, uh, but there are times where I feel like, gosh, I really need my formal meditation practice right now. And, um, so, so I know you published a lot, especially recently on loving kindness. Is that your go-to meditation practice? It, it is, it is, um, and in part uh, because I feel like um, as an academic, I can tend to be in my head a lot, right. and I like the balance of loving kindness meditation because it um, kind of reminds me to not just bring a laser attention to everything, but a warmth uh, and kindness. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, I love it as well. And the one um, YouTube video that I go to, and that pops up as number one when you type in loving kindness, is the one in which um, there's a the, the guide basically leads the meditator through these kind of phases where you think about somebody who's, um, you, I think you think about yourself first and somebody who's really close to you and somebody who's just an acquaintance, like somebody you met at the grocery store. And finally, to somebody that you actually hate. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is send them good vibes, mm -hmm. send them positivity. May they be happy, may they be peaceful, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I found that sometimes I do this in my class. I just lead them. You know, I don't. I, mean, I basically play the YouTube video, and then we all sit together and do it. And when I um, after the thing is over, I ask for comments. I actually, you know, it's not uncommon for me to see tears rolling down people's eyes, right? I mean, just to send out love to people that you hate. It's such a Odd thing to do on the face of it, mm -hmm. but you are the one who benefits from it. Yeah. In the end. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, you're being uh, I'd like to point out that um, there's nothing metaphysical about it. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, I'm not against people having physical beliefs or yeah. spiritual beliefs, but you can find the benefits of loving kindness on yourself and your social world completely through um, understanding affective science. I mean, if you um, are creating more of a sense of uh, warmth and openness in your attitudes about other people, that shows up on your face. It shows up in your posture. It shows up in how you uh, move through space. Uh, people who are experiencing more positive emotions have more open torsos. Mm -hmm. They have more open minds. They are more interested and curious in other people. And lo and behold, other people notice that. Mm -hmm. And so if you come into a space and you're feeling kinder, warmer, more relaxed, that makes everybody else kinder, warmer, more relaxed. And so your own loving kindness meditation does affect other people but not because you're quietly sending wishes. It's because you bring yourself to the world differently after you have that as a, um, a practice or an intention. So um, uh, I think that um, that's when, I think sometimes people have this hesitation or a dislike of loving kindness meditation because they think it sounds like rainbows and unicorns and you're just, you know, sitting here wishing other people feel good <laughs> and, you know, not really seeing, you know, it's, it's, it's changing your, um, uh, you know, it's changing who you are in the world in terms of how you uh, connect with others and that, that ends up having a big impact. In so your I ended up uh, Anais Nin's quote here. I don't know if you've um, heard it. She said something like, Things are not the way they are. Things are, you see the things the way you are. Yeah. Right? So if, if you come with an open attitude, then the world seems to change around you. Mm -hmm. And it's partly because they see you differently as well. And that's the point you're making, I think. Is that yeah. You yeah. I um, every once in a while teach, um, you know, business executives and like workshops and uh, different kind of um programs and there was this one guy who had a great example of this he was you know pretty stern serious guy and he realized he was on vacation and he'd just gotten done surfing or body surfing or something and he couldn't figure out why everybody was being so nice to him afterwards mm -hmm. and then he realized it's because he got up from the from the water and he was beaming because he had enjoyed himself so much and then all of a sudden, everybody was like, hey, man, man, that's great. <laughs> you know, he didn't realize that it was because he had yeah, just had this great experience. And all of a sudden, like the entire social world opened up around him. Um, another way you can see that sometimes is if you give a little kid a camera mm -hmm. and you have them take pictures of people. And so you see this like toddler, like holding a camera and then everyone's like, oh, cute. And so you see these images of people that they never give that face to you but they give it to that kid and so um uh it just you know how you how you bring yourself to the world is gonna is definitely gonna let people be more or less open mm -hmm. by the way guys i know that many of you are wondering why mel is not here it turned out that she had something come up in the last minute um some kind of work related thing and so that's why she's not here okay and I know that it's not quite as exciting without Mel, okay? But I promise you that she's going to be back next week. Okay, so um, one last kind of topic that I want to explore with you, Barb, uh, and then we'll move on to the audience questions. And this has to do with the uh, Losada ratio, Losada line, whatever you want to call it. But the basic idea being that uh, negative experiences and emotions are more sticky and they tend to have a bigger psychological impact on you. And uh, so while you can't, kind of hope that positive experiences and emotions have a similar kind of intensity and amplitude, what you can do is to compensate for that through just sheer quantity of positive, mm -hmm. you know, you call it positivity offset, I think. Right. Um, so uh, it, this is, of course, got a long history of uh, research. Um, Paul Rosen and uh, lots of other people have talked about negativity bias. There's right. the concept of loss aversion, Kahneman-Tversky. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, 
I want to ask you a little bit about uh, this idea of how did you think about even the how did you even conceptualize the idea that you know you could offset the negativity dominance of bias through sheer quantity and uh, what process did you go through to kind of quantify it and try and come up with some kind of a ratio? Um, or I know there's some kind of um, controversy around this, and in the end, though, people do agree that you know there's no doubt about negativity bias. I think, or very little. You know, a colleague of mine just recently published something that has to do with positivity bias. Uh, but I, I'll just leave it there and then uh, let you kind of expand on right. it. Right. Well, there's really. Um, well-established asymmetries um, between positive and negative emotion. And it's not, uh, negativity bias is one. That is that um, kind of measure for measure, negative emotions grab our attention more, yeah. are experienced as a bit more intense. Um, and in a way that's because of the other asymmetry that we experience more um, in daily life, which is, Pot, uh, if you're reasonably mentally healthy. Now, right now, that's not most of us actually um, because we're all cooped up and depressed and anxious. Um, but on normal times, people tend to experience more positive emotions in daily life than negative emotions. They're mild, they're not intense positive emotions. And the mild but frequent positive emotions are what um, contribute to mental health. Um, in a way, negative emotions have to scream so loudly is because they're statistically rare mm -hmm. in our days. Um, now, that is not the case if you're constantly watching, you know, television or whatever, because negativity bias is so strong that it just um, uh, takes over certain um, media. But um, uh, we're designed so that negative emotions don't escape our attention. That's what negativity bias is about, is just making sure that you don't miss that possibly possible danger. Um, but the other side of the, the other asymmetry is that positive, positive emotions are way more frequent. Um, and then the question that I got interested in is people who are in really good mental health, What's their ratio of positive to negative emotions? And how does that differ from people who are languishing or just getting by? Early on in positive psychology, this idea that of flourishing mental health um, uh, really caught my interest in terms of, you know, can we diagnose people as doing exceptionally well as opposed to just not being depressed or not being having psychopathology in their life? And so that's where um, I was looking at, uh, how would you describe the difference in emotional profiles of people who are flourishing versus people who are not? And at the time, I, um, through my connections to Michigan Business School, met um, Marcel Losada, who was doing some mathematical modeling on that. On that. And, um, you know, he approached me and said, I think I have some mathematical modeling that supports your theory. And I got curious, we looked at it and we brought, we wrote a paper where we brought his mathematical modeling with theory and data from my lab. So as it turns out, his mathematical modeling is not to be um, defended, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but most of what we tend to study in psychology usually is a combination of theory and data. Yeah. So theory and data still support this idea that um, a higher ratio of positivity to negativity is associated with mental health. Um, there are some, some particulars about an exact tipping point that I no longer subscribe to, but, but that doesn't kind of take away the heuristic value of knowing that you know, people who are doing really well in life tend to have three to one, four to one, five to one ratios of positive to negative emotion. Um, and that doesn't necessarily need, need to be over an hour in a day. You know, it's just kind of like your diet over a week or over a month, I would say. You know, if you can keep that uh, balance, it's um, that's why we have to be so intentional about mm. um, taking time for ourselves, meditating, figuring out what it is that brings us joy whether it's your hobbies, your aspects of your work, um, nature, so on. Um, 
all these things we need to do to counteract the negative that we're feeling. It's even more important now. I mean, we find that we're, we're, we've been studying people's responses to, um, you know, staying at home for COVID-19 and um, finding that the most resilient people are, are um, leaning into self-care a lot. And that self-care ends up having a bigger impact for people who are going through difficult times. Mm -hmm. You know, people who have the most negative emotions, thankfully, get the biggest benefit out of their self-care efforts. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe you can then talk a little bit about that as maybe the last thing that I'll ask you uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, are there specific self-care strategies? I have a colleague here, I'm sure you know her, Kristen Neff, uh, self-compassion. Mm -hmm. um, so would that, be the kind of go-to strategy for self-care, be, being self-compassionate? Are there any other things that people can do? Well, we lump a lot of things together in self-care. Mm -hmm. um, self-compassion is one, self, um, and acceptance is a really huge way to um, address negative emotions. I mean, one of the uh, negativity bias actually has a, um, a possible counter that that it might be more descriptive of young people than old people. Older people tend to have an effortful bias and focus towards the positive. And negative things don't grab older people's attention as much. I'm referring to Laura Carstensen's work here. Um, and there's some really nice work to show that the reason, the, the kind of magic ingredient that older people bring to daily life is acceptance. You know, the, something bad happens, it's more like, well, that's the way it is, yeah. you know, um, uh, rather than fighting it and wishing it wasn't the case and trying to count, counteract, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you're fatalistic and just yeah. like, oh, it's going to be awful or whatever. You still have, uh, you know, the engine of hope to help you create something different in the future, but there's no point in fighting what just happened in terms of the past. So self-compassion is a practice in accepting you know mm -hmm. one's negative state so that's huge self-care could be meditation self-care could be engaging with your hobbies self-care could be physical uh, exercise so um, i use that term really broadly so. okay that's great okay so we're going to move on to the audience questions and i'm going to bring elena up guys so elena is here with us today all right uh so that's awesome and um, I'm actually, again, going to usurp Elena's uh, uh, place here a little bit just for the first question because it just caught my attention. This is from Robin, and she asks you uh, uh, whether you think that positive emotions have higher vibrations. Okay, let me just give you a little bit of context to this because the reason why this caught my attention is because I saw this documentary uh, a few years back, maybe even a decade back, called What the Bleep Do We Know? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. See this? Okay. Yeah. So that they... Um, have this little vignette of this Japanese, I think, uh, researcher or photographer who goes around capturing pictures of water, I think, yeah. around people who are meditating or people who are angry and people who are busy and so on. And he finds that these water molecules kind of coalesce into different shapes, yeah. more harmonious shapes when people are sending out good vibes and meditating. Uh, so um, I think this question is kind of related to it. Do you think that, I don't know if you're able to see the question, but positive emotions have quote unquote higher vibrations or different vibrations, yeah. and are they even measurable? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I met, I saw that movie too, thought it was really intriguing, tried to look into, okay, what's the science? <laughs> yeah. Now, I was not impressed when I saw the level of rigor of the science yeah. on that, but I can't tell you that that means there's no effects there in terms of, um, uh, you know, Vibrations could happen at so many different levels. Are you talking brain waves? Are you talking um, uh, other aspects that you know we can pick up on how people are moving through space, how that pushes air through the space? You know, um, the rate at which you know people's vocal folds are going and putting their voice out into the world. There are so many um, levels yeah. at which that question could be uh, addressed. And um, I don't know of any good science that uh, shows that right now, but um, I wouldn't rule it out, put it that way. That's awesome. So you're open to the possibility that depending on the kind of measure that we're talking about, you could see some effects. Yeah. I mean, surely uh, breathing patterns change depending on your mood, your, your voice volume pitch changes depending on your mood. 
-hmm. and that's definitely going to have some effects on the external environment. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Elena, over to you. Well, first of all, uh, nice to be here with you. And I wanted to say that we it seems like we're getting more international because we have people from look all over the world. We have people from Spain, Canada, the United States, Greece, Germany, France, Mexico, Brazil, India, Peru, Russia. Oh, Maybe wonderful. some other countries that were not mentioned, but that's a lot of countries. <laughs> and uh, we have people from different backgrounds, like uh, psychologists, mindfulness instructors, career coaches, family counselors, humor writers. I think I guess one uh, humor <laughs> writer. <laughs> that's. Uh, uh, John, John yeah. and then IT engineer, uh, English teachers, doctors. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, so we have some uh, interesting questions, and I think we could start with the question from Ravil. That's uh, about um, it's 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 like this. So if we see the world as we are, that is good. If we see um, if we are around loving and kind people, and what happens if we're surrounded by he says wolves. <laughs> wolves. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think if we're surrounded by wolves, we'll probably be um, more likely to be pulled in that direction ourselves, you know? So, um, but uh, I don't believe that people are like full time wolves versus full time. Uh, whatever the opposite you want that to be, <laughs> a nice wolf. <laughs> um, there's a there's a classic. I think it's a Native American thing about you know which wolf do you feed the nice wolf or the or the bad wolf. But um, uh, I think you know most humans have the capacity to be you know bitter and revengeful or open and and kind and. Um, I, I don't think we serve ourselves well by completely pigeonholing people into one or one or the other. Now, there are certainly very ex some extreme people who um, it's hard to see their good side ever. <laughs> um, uh, no names need to be mentioned, uh, but um, uh, most that's not the case for most humans. You know? that there's um, people have their good sides and their bad sides. And the, I think the thing is to try to um, uh, help support people bringing out their better sides. Right. Um, and there may be some strategies for it. I'm reminded of uh, the very first uh, session that we had with Pete McGraw. And he said that uh, getting rid of, and this sounds bad the way that I'm articulating it. He didn't use those words, but uh, I guess not putting yourself in a situation where you're encountering a particularly negative person in your life. While I agree with you about that, you know, everyone's kind of like, you know, got a range of behaviors. It's not like everyone's either a sinner or a saint, but at the same time, people do have default tendencies. I think some people are more complaining in nature. Some people are more pessimistic in nature and so on by nature. And so he, he said in his research, what he found is that um, just avoiding that one really negative person mm -hmm. has a bigger impact on your mood uh, um, than uh, seeking out the company of that one positive person. You know, something like the ratio of N, but like, you know, three times as much or something like that, he said. Right. right. It's not surprising in that, um, uh, that the, this idea that there's a, a ratio of positive to negative emotions, um, the asymmetry suggests that actions you take to reduce the negativity are, are going to have bigger effects yeah. than those actions you take to increase positivity. The, the nice heuristic value of this ratio is that it reminds you that there's multiple ways to change a ratio. Yeah. Um, reducing negativity is, um, is really uh, influential. So um, yeah, I think it, it bears trying to figure out where are the sources of negativity in your day. Sometimes they might come all from one person, in which case avoiding that person could, I could see definitely how that could have a big effect. Right, Elena, back to you. Okay, a question from Kyla about uh, positive and negative self-talk. Um, what about negative self-talk? Does it not play in the negativity bias? And research has shown that we engage seven times more in neg negative self-talk than we do in positive self-talk. Yeah, I, that's where I think individual differences are really huge. 
um, that uh, it'd be very hard to say that there's like a seven to one ratio for all people on that because um, uh, self-compassion, you know, people who've been practicing self-compassion probably don't, um, uh, you know, have that same sort of constantly facing the negative, you know. Um, and I think just bringing awareness. I mean, this is what a mindfulness practice is all about is realizing, oh, okay, why, where'd that thought come from? And how, you know, checking it out against reality. Um, but uh, they, I think what, what um, is beneficial about a mindfulness practice is just that what's called decentering, which is not accepting your thoughts as the truth. Mm -hmm. um, being able to have a thought and then kind of step back and say, well, that's a thought. <laughs> you know, maybe that's not the most helpful thought, or maybe it's not an accurate thought, or maybe that's a thought that has to do with fear, or that's, that's I guess that's my anger talking, you know, um, or some other way in which you understand that the thoughts are shaped by emotions, thoughts are shaped by context, but they don't have to be definitive and real. So um, I think emotions and um, uh, mindfulness practices are having awareness of emotion and then getting to that through kind of mindfulness practice or meditation practices can really be helpful for addressing self-talk. Um, if we feel like we're being um, kind of held down by self-talk, those are really good resources. Okay, so here's a personal question for both of you. Uh, what is your ratio of negative to positive self-talk? <laughs> mm. um, I think my ratio is pretty on the optimistic side. Oh, okay. Um, I definitely in in uh, in my house, I have um, the the um, optimism bias really, <laughs> um, and so my my husband and I realized that you know it's actually a pretty good pairing because he'll he'll let me know when I'm not being real, <laughs> and then I'll let him know when he's being too um, uh, too unrealistic as well in the other direction. So I think any two people are going to differ as to who tends to be more optimistic so my my self-talk so totally doesn't go the seven negative to one <laughs> okay all right so would you say that it's actually in the opposite direction even uh, maybe seven yeah. to one positive okay so yeah. I, I i guess you already hinted at this that um some people might accuse you of being pollyanna-ish or maybe even delusional mm -hmm. but have you ever um undertaken a kind of a scientific um way of resolving this you know say okay let's take a look at all the things that I predict will happen and let's see what proportion of those turn out to be true. And in your case, I'm assuming that those are going to be positive predictions. And uh, likewise, this is it for other people in your life and see to what extent they were right versus you were right. You know, um, I think that the what I've learned over the years kind of actually fits a little bit with some of your work that you started the conversation with is that um, uh, this, uh, this I've learned from um, studying resilient people mm -hmm. um, is that they don't have to brace themselves for what negative thing might happen. There's sort of a, a trust that yeah. something bad happens, I'll be able to deal with it. Yeah. And so what people who score lower on self-report questionnaires of resilience tend to, if, if you tell them something bad might happen, mm -hmm. they respond as if it did. Mm -hmm. They respond as if it already happened, mm -hmm. it might happen. Mm -hmm. And so you get that sort of um, rigid mm -hmm. bracing. And people who are uh, more resilient are like, oh, something bad might happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they kind of just like, well, if it happens, I'll deal with it. I'll, I'll deal with it, yeah. yeah. So um, the... Uh, I think it's not so much that you have to be right in your forecast that it's going to be a good outcome. Yeah. It's that, well, odds are it's going to be a good outcome. And if it's not, I'll deal with it. Right. Good. I like that. Elena? And by the way, guys, those who are watching in, are tuning in, please do type in your ratio, OK? I want the negative first and then the positive. So if it's more positive than negative, so it's got to be 1 to 7 in Barb's case, OK? So I just want to see what the ratios are. All right, Elena, go for it. 
Well, for me, I haven't really found out the way to calculate that yet. I think the first step for me has been to be aware of them. So that's where I am right now. At least I'm aware and I'm happy that I've learned to at least identify those thoughts because before it used to be something automatic. I think that uh, reading the book, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle helped me to be more aware of those thoughts. So I'm at that stage and next I'm going to count, <laughs> start counting. Wonderful. Yeah. Very good. I don't know if you have another question, but because it brought up Eckhart Tolle, I want to ask Barb this question. Uh, you're obviously um, very much in favor of um, providing evidence for things, not jumping to conclusions, not being a kind of, for lack of a better word, a faith-based kind of an approach. You're more of a evidence-based approach. What do you think of people who promote happiness, but not necessarily through a evidence-based approach? Uh, yeah. What is your kind of reaction to them? Do you have a knee-jerk kind of negative reaction to them because they're saying things that may not be defendable? And oftentimes there could be even a kind of a um, self-serving bias there that, you yeah. know, they would be a guru of some sort. Right. Um, what, what is your reaction? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's a really important uh, place for checking out um, how advice you get and hear matches on to scientific evidence. One of my problems with, um, uh, I like to say, um, a little bit of knowledge about positive psychology can be a dangerous thing because people will sometimes come away thinking they should always feel good, mm -hmm. that um, no matter, or that they should, whatever it is that's bad, they should like tamp it down, yeah. um, as if negative emotions are evil and positive emotions are the only thing that's worthwhile. I mean, there's really nice science now on having that um, uh, extreme view of happiness or right. an excessively valuing happiness is actually more correlated with depression, bipolar right. disorder, and, and psychopathology, um, that people can get overly attached to feeling good. Um, I feel like uh, a better understanding of emotion science will get you to realize that, no, emotions are really about the fit between you and your context. And um, so you can't just force yourself to feel a certain way. You kind of have to create, till the soil, create the conditions for good feeling. Sometimes that's tilling the soil in your thoughts, like thinking about what you could be grateful for. Other times it's tilling the soil in terms of how you spend your time. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I do feel like um, we kind of have a, an obsession with happiness in our culture. And, um, you know, there's, uh, you should always just, you know, try on ideas you hear from people uh, and test them out in your own life. That's kind of what the Buddha said, is like, don't believe anything I say, mm -hmm. test it out in your own life and pick what works for you. And um, if you don't feel like you're getting a good message about try this out and if you like it, if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, set it aside. You know, if someone's get, selling you something more rigid than that, then you should be wary. <laughs> awesome. All right, Elena. And uh, everybody wants to know your ratio, Raj. Oh, my ratio? <laughs> <laughs> I type it in. Um, I actually, you know, I have to say that I'm similar to you in that regard, both of you actually, um, partly I, I do know that it's it's more positive than negative, okay? Mm -hmm. And I have a similar situation in that I'm I'm generally surrounded by people who tend to be a little more uh, on the negative side, and they do on occasion blame me for uh, you know or, or accuse me of being too delusional. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the end, like Barb said, I think that uh, sometimes. Um, the objective reality is a function of your subjective perceptions. You know, that if you think that you can achieve something, you're actually going to ha have a higher chance of achieving it. And let's say that somebody writes me an email um, that's negative and people around me are saying that that means bad things for you in the future, right? But I say, no, not necessarily. They just, you know, had a bad day or they misinterpreted what I said or whatever. You know, when I meet them next, I'm going to apologize. You know, I got to own my, my part of the thing for it. Uh, and things are going to be okay then that vibe that I bring tends to kind of change the future. You know, if I'd gone in with a negative attitude, perhaps it would have gone down. It's become more of a bit of a virtuous cycle because of... So um, I, in the end, I would say more positive, but not quite in the extreme as Barb. I think not one to seven, <laughs> maybe, but um, 
Maybe I don't one. keep track. I just know that I um, um, uh, am not suffering. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I mean, you look like you're thriving. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, that doesn't mean that this whole cooped up um, time, you, you have to take the circumstances in account. We're having a great conversation. You're interested in my ideas that can be enlivening. Um, but the whole idea of just, you know, pretty much staying uh, home and not uh, adventuring out in the world, that I work, you know, that is a big predictor of people's mental health. You know, there's an interesting, one of my students brought a paper to my attention the other day is that the more variety people have in their um, exploration of their physical environment, like GPS tracking, how, how, mm -hmm. many, how wide is your radius, predicts future mood. Um, and so all this staying at home, it's, it's kind of depressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. that's true. And so I, all the more reason for us to thank you for taking the time to talk to us, really. I mean, really appreciate it. I know you're super busy. And for those uh, who may not know this, um, she, uh, Barb was the past uh, president of IPA, uh, which is uh, the International Positive Psychology Association. And so she's kind of like a poster child for all of positive psychology. Yeah. Okay. And so we're really honored and uh, really grateful that you were able to spend so much time with us. Yeah. All right. So we have another five minutes or so. Um, and so, you know, a last maybe couple of questions, I guess. Okay, two more questions. And uh, we have a similar question coming from John, Ankita, and Ravi. They're talking about people who, uh, when, when they get older, they still kind of don't have this mindset of acceptance. So, what is the threshold, and uh, and what why is that happening? So, people that that are older still are not um, accepting. Well, I think. Just because we see uh, in the overall scientific evidence that there are age differences in emotional profiles, that doesn't negate the fact that many of us are going to know somebody who's older who's just mm -hmm. totally curmudgeonly and they're not positive or accepting at all. Personality also exists. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I think we can't assume that somebody simply because of age is going to get to acceptance. But um, uh, it's one of the, uh, Laura Carstensen who studies um, emotion and aging was my, um, my uh, doctoral mentor. And you know, she's like, there's this elusive thing called experience mm -hmm. that you know, once you've had decades of experience of life's up and ups and downs that, you know, that makes a difference, but not everybody who is older has a lot of kind of broadening, eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. You, you um, we need to kind of look at how people have lived their lives. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, if, that people haven't, um, we do know that if people travel more, they, it creates more openness to different cultures. Um, uh, reading can do similar things, um, and so uh, you really have to look at how people have spent their time. Okay. Because the not always you're not always going to have a set of experiences that lead you to realize, oh, I'll get over this. Right. For some people, I think you know, life's ups and downs, getting beaten up, actually makes them more compassionate, more mellow, more willing to. Um, see other people suffering and experience them and other people, you know, they get hurt and they want to hurt back now, right? I mean, it's an interesting kind of, you know, which fork do you take um, right. depending on life's experiences. Yeah. And there's a lot about early life experience that um, shapes that too, that we need to uh, understand. But um, stress while uh, while we're, you know, still in, in utero um, affects yeah. um, brain development in ways that set up emotional uh, temperaments um, that are shaped before we were even born, you know. So. Okay, one last question. Elena. Okay, last question, quick question. I think we can connect it with the context in which we're living now, the isolation. And you were talking a lot about outdoor, outdoors. And so uh, 
also we have a question from uh, Julia and uh, and Sydney. They were talking about different weather conditions, but now we're isolated. And so, what can we do during the quarantine and the pan pandemic times that we are out inside? And what, uh, how can can we maybe replace going out as a source of positive emotions? And and what can we do? Maybe you can share your personal um, advice, since for you that's one of the major inspirations yeah. going out. I am extraordinarily lucky in that I don't live in a very dense um, place. If I were um, in a city, it would be a lot tougher. Um, I am in a really small town, uh, a coastal town, um, that uh, before <laughs> summer began was very, very low population. Um, but uh, I can get out uh, really early in the day or late in the day and avoid crowds that way. So, um, but, uh, and not everybody, I mean, so I feel really, really blessed. Um, uh, everybody's gonna have a different circumstance. You know, sometimes people will have a little bit of a deck that can be, you know, safe and distant from other people and still be outside. Um, you know, opening windows, you know, it, it really just depends where you are. I feel really. What about screensavers? Screensavers on your laptops? You think that do it? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I I am um, I am collaborating with somebody who's looking at whether virtual immersion technology that has nature can have similar effects. Um, I think it's really worth exploring. Okay. We tend to not put. I mean, I have two teenage sons. People put themselves into virtual environments. They're not beautiful. Uh, <laughs> they're not kind. <laughs> they're, uh, you know, I, I, I'll go downstairs and see my high school son. I'm like, killing people again? <laughs> uh, you want to kill people before dinner. <laughs> so uh, we need to think about um, using those, uh, using our powers for good. But I don't know, uh, we, we don't have the evidence yet as to whether that's gonna be um, comparable. Hmm. All right, so on that note, I mean, that's kind of like almost like a Matrix movie kind of ending, right? I mean, if you go into virtual reality, maybe we are already in virtual reality for all we know, right? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> all thank you very, very thank much. Thank you so much. We yeah. really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us from all around the world. Uh, this was an awesome session and as usual, uh, I didn't tell you this, Bart, but what we do at the end is this one hour, we just make nuggets out of it, two, three minute nuggets mm -hmm. on specific issues mm -hmm. and then put it up on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hope, hoping that you're okay with that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. Great. So, you know, those who um, came in late or, uh, you know, weren't able to follow for whatever reason, um, you'll be able to see the nuggets later on. Okay. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Take care. Have a great weekend. All right.